Good afternoon, everybody. This is Austin Smelly, the host of Beyond the Well. This is episode seven. This is kind of follow up on an interview I did with Paul Wagner a few weeks ago. Another werewolf operative, someone I've been very excited to talk to. I've admired their work on social media for quite a while. His name is Patrick Duggan. He's a tattoo artist, but I'll go ahead and let him describe that yourself. So how you doing, Patrick? Thank you for coming on. Hey, hey man, how's it going? It's, it's kind of strange. It's, it's spelled like it would be Duggan, but apparently some of us got an extra G along the way somewhere. So it's actually Duggan, strangely enough. But yeah, uh, more better known as Biker Witch Tattooer. But <laughs> I don't know what it is. I don't, with Paul, too, I just can't pronounce names apparently all of a sudden, but it's all right. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, I, I don't know, maybe that's an Operation Werewolf thing or something, you know, we all have uh, strange pronunciations for names or something, I don't know. <laughs> hey, honestly, to kind of get into that, my last name is Smedley, I've gotten Schmedley, Smed, I've gotten all kinds of, I even misspelled my own last name until I was like seven years old, so it's all right. <laughs> I think I think I double take it, my own middle name sometimes being Michael, you know, the A and the E never quite looks right. Yeah, yeah, that European spelling, but uh, to kind of get things going here, like, uh, I've mentioned to you before, like I've been following your tattoo work on uh, social media and all that. And I actually wasn't even aware that you ran a YouTube channel until you brought that to my attention. I just, I just find a lot of how you approach tattooing and your own spiritual practices to be fascinating. So if you could give a little bit of a background of what you consider your beliefs to be or your spiritual practices, anything like that. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it's kind of been an evolving thing over the years. And, and I mean, um, I think, uh, when I was a young kid, uh, I kind of had a lot of strange things happen to me when I was a child, and my grandmother kind of uh, was a big part in raising me when I was a kid, and she was kind of into um, this sort of angel magic stuff, and she had a good friend who was uh, like a tower reader. He used to come by her house pretty often. Uh, you know, my grandma was, um, she she did all, all kinds of like strange you know, folk magic sort of things and stuff all the time, just kind of old, old country, uh, you know, um, again, like little folk traditions and that sort of stuff. She was said some, some sort of weird, you know, stand on your head in a fucking tub full of yellow kind of shit. And we got old or something. But, um, so I think that kind of, uh, really stuck with me as a kid. And I, I think I went through a period when I got into like punk rock and stuff and, uh, hardcore. Um, cause I grew up like, you know, my, my, my mom and my uncle that I lived with were big into uh, kind of the metal scene, which exposed me to kind of some strange ideas. I mean, once I started getting into hardcore, I, I came into contact with some guys who were like into Hare Krishna and, and Zen Buddhism, and I went that route for a while. But I think um, just uh, some of the experiences in my life and the way that I grew up and stuff, I was always kind of attracted to more the dark side of things. Um, and uh, I actually got really into Zen Buddhism for a long time. Um, but then, uh, while I was at art school, I took a class on uh, Irish literature, and um, in the class, I remember we were talking, and I mean, I, I think up until this point, I had like, like read uh, um, the uh, Satanic Bible, and that was probably about one of the only Western uh, sort of things that I had gotten into. I mean, I was kind of uh, interested, like, politically in some, like, libertarian politics, that sort of stuff. I think I had maybe even read Might is Right at that point. But uh, kind of that was as far as my, my knowledge of Western spirituality went. But in this Irish literature course, um, I remember the professor kind of talking about William Butler Yeats and him being involved with uh, theosophy and um, kind of uh, Helena Blavatsky and that sort of stuff. And she didn't know much about it, but I was, wait a second, like, I mean, me being predominantly of Irish descent, she was like, yeah, they were some sort of mixture of like um, – Ritual magic, uh, you know, Wicca-ish druidry, um, old Irish stuff, and then Buddhism and Hinduism. And I was like, wait a second, like, like, what, what is that? She's like, I really don't know any more about it. So off I went to the library to really get anything I could, which um, I went on a binge reading, quickly found Crowley and that sort of stuff, got in, then found, like, Typhonian Current, and uh, also the kind of... Um, uh, Norse magic sort of stuff, which really immediately gained my interest. And uh, I kind of equal parts went down this kind of Christian demonology, Typhonian magic, uh, chaos Gnostic sort of direction, while also exploring kind of Norse magic, which I think has led me to some of the thirst of truth sort of stuff over the last few years and, and that sort of thing. So that's kind of a long roundabout of how I ended up where I am now. Yeah, it's funny. It's hard to talk to anybody like the spiritual path, regardless of what path you take, whether that be Christian or pagan or whatever it may be. It's never a straight line. It's always uh, lots of bumps in the road. And you kind of touched on your interest in Buddhism. 
when you were younger and that was yep. kind of like your your entry point there like i grew up and i started my introduction to all this stuff was anton LaVey's work of course like in the west that's huge it's like the introductory step into the left-hand path and all this other stuff so i still think it's where people, most people should come into it yeah i would i would agree with that too it's kind of like a, a good baseline to have just to really understand all of the left hand because it can be pretty intimidating to get into it when you're fresh and you whether you came out of a christian background or a catholic background whatever it is most of the time it's from the abrahamic faiths what about buddhism I, that, that kind of that cur- that made me curious what about buddhism drew you to it like the whole zen thing meditation anything like that well i think i, I was kind of i was attracted to the fact that it was really disciplined and um again like i think uh i was really interested in kind of the mythology that the uh Kind of like Krishna dudes that I had met up with, but there were some things that were um, kind of blaringly uh, problematic to me. Um, you know, like some of the revulsion of the flesh sort of stuff and the uh, like hatred of like um, kind of sexuality or aversion to it and kind of seeing it as like a well of pain and stuff that didn't really strike a chord with me. So um, I think that's where like Buddhism seemed like the logical, like, I mean, I didn't see as many guys into Buddhism in the hardcore scene, but there was enough of them that I kind of found that and it was this I think I was attracted to a lot of things that just required a ton of discipline so the fact that something was just telling me that the way for me to kind of like find the answers I was looking for was to literally sit on this mat stare at this wall and um, figure it out myself and you know if you were going to try and ask questions well what is the meaning of life you'd get told to just sit the fuck down and shut up I was really attracted to that and I think that that taught me a lot of uh foundational things that kind of led into um my ability to concentrate on really any occult path that i was gonna kind of try and dip my fingers into you know because i mean even just sitting down and reading the fucking books i mean how many people can't in today's society muster up enough attention span to do really much of anything let alone read a book on some kind of esoteric topic i I like what you said there about like the buddhism and the whole discipline thing because with operation werewolf and a lot of pagan practices, just whether it be physical training or just taking care of yourself mentally and physically, it takes discipline to get there. And, I, and I've, I've asked a few other people about their attraction to Buddhism and discipline is always one of the top things that they mention because it can be difficult oh, to and, get that. And it's hilarious to me, the, the amount of people that think that like they have all these preconceived notions about meditation and surely there's some meditation schools that are like, you know, you go off to some sort of like spa, like, um, you know, blissed out uh, meditation state but zen was never that for me it was very intense both physically i mean your knees are in pain you're sitting there like i remember sitting there i think the longest I ever sat was probably somewhere in the ballpark of about four hours and i mean you start noticing how your brain will do anything to not be bored i started hoping like a plane would crash through the fucking wall just to basically have something happen like so it was actually like agonizing at points so it's it's funny to me this this preconceived notion that people have about meditation and stuff and I'm like dude sit down and stare at that wall for for that prolonged period of time in a lotus position and tell me about how uh you know blissed out you feel I think you'll have a very different take on it once you actually do it There's a reason why in a prison system if you are the top on the rung in terms of killing and raping and all this other stuff a horrible criminal the very worst thing that you can do to someone is put them in a room Solitary by themselves confinement. Yeah, our our minds have one hell of a way of uh, twisting, twisting our our making our imagination to create all these crazy scenarios. Like we hallucinate if we don't have any input. That's pretty wild to me. So all this, yeah, and I mean, yeah, there's an ahead. incredible power you can get from that sort of experience too. I mean, I, I I've I've had the uh, pleasure of meeting Damien Eccles a few times, and I, I mean, he spent a long time in solitary confinement. And I think it's um in a lot of ways, I think it's part of my spiritual path that I find that. And, and even me being successful in tattooing, some of the worst things that, that happen to us in life end up being some of the biggest advantages that we have down the line because they gift us things that most people don't have. Um, gives us a certain perspective and a certain, again, discipline and uh, power because of the, the shitty things that happen to us in life. Beyond just discipline, because uh, we, that's a pretty easy to understand, um, what about your spiritual path have you obtained that you wouldn't obtain in a Christian way of living or a Catholic way of living apart from discipline? Um, well, I think most obviously is I, I don't, I find it very frustrating sometimes. This is something I've been talking about a lot recently is that you talk to most spiritual people and I think that they automatically assume no matter what path you're coming from that you believe in 
that there is a kind of cosmic justice underneath everything. And I think it hasn't been my experience that I, I think that I embrace that under everything, the nature of reality is chaos. And I mean, we can align with different gods, these sorts of things, and they can cause like shelters for us where we're able to um, come under their guidance and kind of be sheltered from some of the chaotic elements of reality. But I think embracing the fact that that is the underlying nature of reality, I think gives you a certain perspective and you understand your place in the universe and that in a kind of existentialist sort of way, you know, in that John Paul Sartre, Albert Camus sort of way, we're not given any inherent meaning in this life. And it's something that we have to fight for. We have to fight for our happiness, our purpose in life. And I mean, cause it's not something that's just given to us. So we really like all the tools are there. It can be a very bleak and misanthropic thing, or it can be a very liberating thing. Um, I mean, the Arthur Schopenhauer even talked about, I mean, that nihilism was essentially the appropriate response to the world that we live in today. But basically the two ways we can go about responding to that is like, I mean, annihilation and asceticism or embracing art and trying to create something out of this life, despite the fact that it inherently has no meaning. It's almost spitting in the face of the demiurge, turning our lives into the greatest pieces of art that we can. And there's uh, another response to that whole debacle too, like the Schopenhauer and Paul, John Paul Descartes and all that was their stoicism, things of that nature. And I think you touched upon a great point there with nature and the life that we live being innately chaotic and it's very difficult to make anything of yourself if you don't accept the fact that it is chaotic i mean even look at the, the christian tradition like the world was condemned to sin that's kind of that their version of creating that chaos and making it clear that the world that we live in despite the whole cosmic justice part coming in later it's chaotic and you're gonna have to find your place in it and not fall victim to the depression and anxiety and all this just extreme existential existentialism and extreme nihilism kind of like we see in the whole doomer meme today yeah like, i i love um I, it's one of my favorite books that i've probably read it up 30 times but the bhagavad gita i think one of the most powerful things that took away from that book was that even the hindus for as much as like people believe that mainstream hinduism is this like peace and love um everything wonderful all the time movement um it's kind of explicitly stated in that book that that this world is a war ground and it's not a place where a utopia could ever exist. It's um, you know, uh, there's the Cromag song called uh, "World Peace," um, and I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the lyrics that are kind of harsh on that record, you know, not only just come from living on the Lower East Side, but they come from straight out of uh, Hindu mythology and the Gitas and uh, and the, and the Vedas rather. Um, so I, I thought that that was very telling that even this sort of like from an outside perspective seen as a very flowery religious path that they 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 too recognize that this earthly material plane is a chaotic place that's not some place where you build your communist utopian sort of kumbaya society it'll never work well utopia almost by definition is a dystopia according to a good <laughs> chunk yeah, a good chunk of that population because not everybody wants to hold hands in kumbaya some of us some of us just live for the next fight or live for the next drink or we all have our own desires we all have things that we want to chase after you know it's not just uh we, we none of us have the same goals some of us have the same goal that we're striving after as a group you know that's where the whole tribe aspect of operation werewolf and jack donovan all that but it's going to be really difficult to get everybody down and hold hands when I'll be straight up with you. I don't want to hold your hand. <laughs> I want to see what you're no. made of. Exactly. And I mean, it, it's it's known, I mean, too, it's a little something we do a lot in Operation where we'll bring things, you know, back and forth between physical training. I mean, it's it's by chaos, by breakdown that we that we build muscle and we grow and ascend to new levels. You know, it's, it's only through trial and aversion that we grow at all. Yes, absolutely. And that trial and aversion, that can come through an experience where like someone like myself who has difficulty expressing love to strangers or upholding strong tight bonds with people that can be a challenge all on its own but if you don't have that physical framework behind it it's going to be really difficult to ascend to any heights mentally or spiritually no doubt absolutely i mean as much as you know we're kind of imprisoned by these physical bodies i mean our, our brains are part and parcel with them and we really have to uh attend to them on this plane to uh really achieve much of anything Yes, absolutely. And it seems to me, according to like your Instagram page and all this other stuff that you do, tattooing oh. is your way of connecting with the world around oh. you. All right. So, yeah, 
one of the things that I've recognized about your particular interests, judging from your social media and all that, is that you use tattooing not only as a way to express your spirituality, but to connect with the world around you. Is that correct? Absolutely. What about tattooing to you? Because I've heard you mention in some of your two videos, uh, like one of the ones that you drew my attention to was how a lot of people kind of like this hot topic, let's get these cute tattoos on our wrists without them actually meaning anything. What's your viewpoint on that as somebody who does tattooing for a living? Um, I mean, I, I really try to, and it's interesting because I've worked with other tattoo artists and shops who were like, dude, I don't get how you get people to get these sorts of tattoos that you're looking to get. I think people think, but I mean, I'm out in the suburbs, man. I'm on uh, the east end of Long Island. Um, I mean, I travel a lot to go tattoo and things, but really, I think people are by and large searching for something, even if they can't put their finger on it. And I can't tell you how many times people have come in and been looking to get, you know, I don't know, an infinity symbol or something. And I'll explain to them some, you know, mythological aspect that kind of like it's very similar to an Ouroboros. And all of a sudden that 19 year old girl who thought she was getting a, uh, a infinity symbol is now getting an Ouroboros. Or, I mean, I, I had a military guy actually in, in one instance that I tattooed all the time. And I kind of explained to him some of the stuff from the theosophical like Luciferian doctrine. And all of a sudden he went he went out, read it came in and all of a sudden he was getting all these kind of occult tattoos and things because he seemed all fired up and inspired and and again i think people are, are really starved in this time for for kind of real spiritual um deeper things and they don't know what it is that they're looking for all they know is that what they've been given is not not working and i think this is something that nietzsche explained with the god is dead sort of thing and you know crowley talked about even redesigning the tower to go into the new era i mean the dahat deck um, South deck, as some people pronounce it. I mean, it's it's kind of designed for this new era because, you know, astrologically we're we're going into a totally new period. You know, and uh, the Kali Yuga age of down going, and um, you know, it's it's people are noticing and recognizing the changes that are going on, and I think in a lot of ways people are searching for answers. Yeah, it's people are searching for answers, and definitely, I grew up in a Christian church with my own family, and. I can tell from experience and from my own personal experience and people that I know is that that's absolutely correct. People live their lives and with quiet desperation trying to find the, the next hit of whatever it may be. And spirituality is no different. Like a lot of people, it seems like they don't necessarily lack a spiritual, like they, they know that they want to achieve something spiritual, but they, they lack conviction and then they lack direction. Like they don't really know where to start. They really don't know if they believe the things that they do. Which is why when people go and get things tattooed on them, I find that very interesting because that's almost like a, a spiritual commitment that you're making and you're inking it and marking your own body with it. Absolutely. I remember seeing some Christian uh, uh, website that, that kind of wrote some uh, fear mongering piece about how you have to do research on your tattoo artist because like they could be a witch and they could be doing like a blood ritual. And I kind of laugh at it, but I'm also like, it's actually exactly that. I mean, you know, and I think I'm, I'm very open with my customers about it. And I have some straight up Christian uh, clients that come to me very often. And, you know, I think that they're more interested just to see where I'm coming from, you know, and if I'm really being honest that probably make some bad Christians and, you know, sinners. But I mean, again, we're going into a new age and I think uh, a lot of the old ways are not going to be serving people. So they kind of need to start having a conversation. And I think it's interesting to see how some of the new age aspects are starting to seep into mainstream uh, spirituality. Yeah, they are. I mean, that's one of the central points of this show is conversation the, you will never find an answer to a problem or a solution for that matter if you don't sit down and talk about it, regardless of what side that you come from. So you referenced this uh, this new age that's coming. How would you define that age and what do you think your place is in it? Um, I mean, we're very early into it, man. So, uh, I mean, everything I do, I, I, I just try and, you know, lead from obviously my true will, you know, kind of trying to have those deep kind of meditative conversations with yourself and do what seems to be right and not worry about the herd. Um, you know, uh, I've kind of been doing a lot of uh, workings with Belial uh, in in the demonology, you know, goetic aspect for a while. And I think that's kind of serving in a lot of ways to uh, enlighten me to... Um, the kind of antinomian uh, against the grain sort of thing, because I think, you know, during this 100 to 200, 300 years, I think we're setting a lot of the tone for the rest of this age. Uh, you know, with the advent of the Internet and all these new ways that people are able to speak to one another on fucking podcasts like we're doing right now. I mean, we're on opposite ends of the country right now. And we're able to have this conversation. Um, this is something that was completely unheard of, man. You think about the dark ages where we wouldn't even be able to be talking about any of this stuff. It really wasn't that long ago. 
but yet we can have this kind of conversation and openly talk about black magic and witchcraft from two opposite ends of a country that's brand fucking new. It's insane, man. It's completely nuts. It, absolutely. It's kind of, especially in the new, like just how new our country is. Like I think of Rome and the fact that it stood for tens of thousands of years, and then it collapsed. And like, we're only two, not even 300 years in. And especially with all this technological advancement, the fact that we are able to have conversations like this, talking about the things that we're talking about. I mean, I'm pretty sure I would have been stoned quite a long time ago if we were born a hundred or two hundred years ago. But yeah, you need balls, brother. <laughs> yeah, it's just the coming of the tide, and it's very interesting to see because you were talk about how new age sort of ways of thinking are seeping their way into mainstream religion and mainstream spirituality. I kind of think back to the interviews in the 1980s and 1990s, kind of the Satanic Panic era. When people like yeah. Nicholas Shrek, who, along with his wife Zena, who were very much on the forefront of that battle, they were very Michael open. Michael Aquino on that uh, oh, yeah. that talk show, it's hilarious. Oh man, was that the one where he that that guy in the audience was talking about he was present at a ritual or something like that where they stabbed yeah, some guy? And he yeah, yeah, and he completely shut him down. He was like, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, what did he say? Some head acolyte or something like that. He's like, that's not even a fucking like a, a ranking in the Church of Satan. Or, you know? That's not even real. I'm, that, I go back to interviews like that all the time just to get a good chuckle. And it's kind of a shame, too, because I when I think of because primarily I, I would assume that guy was likely a Christian now. There are a lot of people who are convicted about a lot of things, and I think that's what someone like myself values in another person. And I think I kind of find that at home with Operation Werewolf's uh, thinking as well. Is I, I heard Jack Donovan mention like a friend that he had. It was just a group of Christian guys that would hang out and they would have like boxing nights and stuff like that. They were convicted mm-hmm. about the things they believed. It's not necessarily the same things that I believe, but they're convicted about them. And I think that conviction and that determination to live that way that that inspires me. It really does. Yeah, there was something that Paul actually touched on in his interview with you guys was uh, talking about how his personal sort of spirituality is not necessarily what the group spirituality is, and you're finding common ground all the time. I mean, I'm one of the founding members of the Nordaster Division um, of Operation Werewolf, and I'll be going to Moot this weekend after Baldur's Funeral, which is a Wolves event down in Virginia. Um, and, I mean, as much as my personal practice is much more eclectic, and I get into this kind of... Um, more demonology and, and, and ceremonial magic sort of things. Um, when I'm, and even, even the more thirst of truth sort of side of the darker aspects of Norse, um, paganism, I think I'm much more into in that group setting, um, more traditional, maybe even, uh, you know, Northern European paganism. And I kind of tone down that sort of stuff because it's our common ground. But, um, I mean, there were certainly, you know, as Paul mentioned, guys within Operation Werewolf who were straight-up Christians. And um, it's interesting to have those conversations, and I think a lot of people think we're a lot more um, uh, uniform than, than it is in reality, which is very interesting. Yeah, there definitely is. I mean, one of the intriguing things to me when I first discovered Operation Werewolf was just how applicable this is, because it's not a religion. Like, I, I've spoken to a few people about my interviews that I've done with him and other people and just discussions that I've had, and they seem confused by it. It's sort of like I approach it like a philosophy. It's a way of living and not necessarily what you believe, like spiritually or religiously. It's more of just this carnal practice of uh, like physical strength is obviously a big pillar of that. And I practice that. I have my friends come over to my house or their houses, and we just – we fight with each other. We make food. We feast. We have discussions. And This is what Operation Werewolf is to me. It's not – let's sit in this room or let's have this ritual that that can come later but it's kind of a framework for everybody to work from so we can all be stronger and use that framework to further our spiritual and philosophical pursuits so to speak i think it always comes back to mutual pressure amongst people to continue to go on the path of being a better person than you were yesterday and being a more complete human being i mean you know it's embracing this physical aspect um you know a spiritual aspect a adventure aspect of just trying to like you know live a life worth fucking living you know um it's 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 a complete package you know when you have some guys who are drawn and more easily complete in one aspect and you might have another guy in your group who's not and you're here to kind of pressure one another to kind of be more like your strongest parts and to acknowledge your weakest parts in that group and have them pressure you then to correct those things and to be a little bit more, you know, maybe one guy isn't exactly 
as physically, you know, uh, strong, you know, and, and I mean, in my division, I'm by far the smallest dude, you know, and, and I mean, I'm pretty strong for a guy of my size. I've, I've done a lot of work in the gym, but at the end of the day, like I'm about half as big as everybody else in my division. So when we start deadlifting, I might be pretty strong at deadlifting for a guy at 165 pounds, but when everybody else in the room is like 220, I'm not really like, you know, but I'm still going to put up a fight to try and keep up with them. Oh, definitely. I'm by far not the biggest guy either. I mean, I, I prioritize and specialize in like cardio based stuff and fighting and like Muay Thai wrestling. That, that was kind of my background. I only recently really started getting into weightlifting and it definitely has you its so, perks. You sound a lot like Craig Williams. I mean, if you look at the way he trains and stuff, he's big into cross country running and stuff. No, I wouldn't go that far. That sounds miserable. <laughs> as, as long as I can, as long as I can run a 5k and not feel like passing out or dying, I think I'm all right. But just that's uh, badass, man. We did um, we actually did a uh, a three mile run um kind of challenge back in October as um a group called the Citadel within Operation Werewolf. That was a lot of fun, and uh, this month um with a few other operatives, just kind of a uh, um a little bit looser sort of thing. We did a hundred mile walking challenge. I believe I'm up to about 180 miles for the month at the moment. Oh man, that's awesome! I I saw that um. Wander Vogel, he went ahead and did something like that, like that. Oh, Cody, yeah, Cody actually came to stay with me on Long Island uh, a few weeks ago, and he's been walking across the country ever since with this guy Jeremy. Um, so he's doing about six months. He's going to be walking all the way across the United States. Last I heard, I believe he's in Erie, Pennsylvania, and that's for uh, his company, Wander Vogel. I'll give him all the credit in the world. I mean, he's turning that walk into a way of life. Like that's <laughs> something that he now makes money doing, and that's. I think that's ultimately what we all kind of strive for. I mean, you're doing that with my tattooing. I'm doing the best I can with this project here, and I'm enjoying the hell out of it. Like, there's no point in doing it if I'm not enjoying it. Absolutely. I, I think I think Cody's trying to one-up. Uh, this is totally not true, but I'm going to say this anyway. Me and Cody rode bicycles from uh, my, my house in New York down to um, Winter War uh, a year and a half ago, which was an event down at Ulfheim, and, uh, which is kind of the base of the Wolves of Inland down there and Operation Werewolf. Um, we rode bicycles six days. We did 650 miles on two pedal bicycles. Uh, so of course he had to one up that by walking across the damn country. <laughs> it's, it's that group pressure is that dynamic that so many people live without. And I, I definitely feel for people who live without that. Like I'm, I'm in California, but I'm pretty isolated out here. I mean, I've got a good site of uh, Mount Baldy. I'm pretty close to that out in the Inland Empire. Like I've seen, that's in, beautiful. yeah, I know. I love it. I, I love the fact that I can see that pretty much from wherever I am. And that's kind of my haven whenever I need to get out or just adjust myself spiritually or mentally to kind of put myself in that proper headspace. Like I've seen that you are out in New York. Are there some naturey mountainous spots out there that you like to visit? Oh, uh, well, I, people a lot of times think that I used to live in Brooklyn. I lived out there for five years. I actually went to art school in Manhattan and I was a New York city bike messenger. But, um, I, uh, I grew up on far eastern north end of Long Island, which is way more rural than most people think. Um, so I come out here and there's deer all over the place. Um, you know, a lot of hunters out here. I think it's a lot more uh, red politically than people would think. Um, but I'm a, probably about 70 miles from New York City. and I mean, I've ridden my bicycle out there from where I'm at, but I think people think that uh, I live within New York City, but that's not the case. I'm a complete novice when it comes to that. I actually went for the, to New York the first time a couple months ago. I went out there for a media convention, and I was it, we stayed in the Bronx, and then we stayed in Manhattan, and then in Brooklyn. So I'm still, like, my mind's all over the place with that city. But it definitely inspired me in a lot of ways, just kind of being in California my entire life and then going out there and seeing the dynamic out there. And I also have a, a buddy who's in the Army, and he's stationed at Fort Drum about six hours north, I think of wherever it is that we were, it definitely gave me a different view of, because whenever people ask me where I'm from, I have to say Los Angeles, because that's the only place people know in California if you don't live here. And uh, Yeah, North, I mean, uh, New York is huge. I mean, once you take in uh, upstate New York, it's humongous. I mean, a lot of people, even the operatives who don't know New York State, will ask me, you know, about uh, Wolf Brigade, which is Greg Walsh's place. He's got a gym up in Rochester, and a lot of people don't realize it's about an eight and a half, nine hour drive from where I am, and that's still New York State. Yeah, I really wanted to touch up. I wanted to visit that place, but unfortunately, we didn't have any time. We we're out there. Definitely on my to do list. So with, absolutely, yeah, man. With the, of course within the pagan world obviously being in nature is a big thing and it's really important to kind of be able to put yourself in the natural world 
it's kind of get your head straight and it just does something for us like we especially for people who live in cities or anything like that when you are out in nature untouched nature with you know all the wildlife and everything it puts you in a different mm-hmm. headspace what exactly would that do do for you because i imagine it does something oh totally man i mean it's I, I i gotta tell you when i lived out in new york city um i was productive i was learning things you know and uh you know i went to school out there um but i'll tell you i never felt more lonely in my life you know and and I, and I had friends i had things like that but i remember you ride the train and you just you, you're so surrounded by people but you feel so isolated and i mean out here in kind of the more rural areas i get to really build a community especially around um the people that i tattoo all the time but not for nothing i can get away from everything i live on like three and a half acres um with like a ton of woods surrounding me in a small cottage in the woods i'm really close to the beach and stuff uh, so it's very easy for me to get out and just clear my head and to get away from from everyone. I mean, it's pretty easy. I do it on a, on a regular and daily basis. Um, again, you know, people thinking that I'm living in New York might not think that that's part of my daily life, but it absolutely is. I mean, even if you watch most of my YouTube videos, a lot of them are taken in the woods around my house. Yeah, I, I from the ones that I have seen, like it just seemed like you were walking, had a device, and you're like, all right, this idea struck my head. I'm going to go ahead and sit this down and record. And yep, I did. I do stuff like that as well, like just to kind of contain thought pieces, make sure I keep my my train of thought, not to lose it. Something about being in this environment stirs something within me, like my very bones, like this is where my ancestors once were. And that just does something for you chemically, these ideas that I wouldn't have thought of because we're out here, it's a little more rural. It's like the, the inland, inland Valley, we're like 40 minutes away from Los Angeles, but it's still super busy and it's really hard to be productive when you're surrounded by all that noise, but feel lonely at yep. the same time. Yeah, um, actually, uh, interestingly, I'm a, I'm going to be in in L.A. Actually, San Pedro uh, um, next month, I believe, from July eighth to like the seventeenth or something like that. So I'll actually be kind of in your neck of the woods. Well, I have to set something up. That's cool. Which San Pedro? What are you going to be out here for? What are you going to be doing? Um, I'm actually going to be tattooing at a, uh, a tattoo shop called Suarte, and I'll be getting my knuckles tattooed by a dude who goes by the name of Oil Burner. Uh huh. I'm pretty new to the whole tattoo tattoo world. Like I said, I've been following you amongst uh, other artists and stuff like that for a little while. But I really didn't decide to get any work done yet until I knew what I wanted to get done. I knew how I wanted it to get done and why I was doing it. Most importantly, like I, I believe I've heard you mention before that tattooing is an ancient art form. It's not something that should just be thrown around kind of frivolously. Like oh, oh Becky, let's go get this. Like you said, infinity symbol. We don't even know what it means. I mean, it's, 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 there's, there's a give and take there. I mean, I definitely have tattoos on my body and I like doing them that are just kind of goofy and just celebrate the fact that like, you know, cause it says something about you. I mean, I, I think that tattooing externalizes your internality and when you get something that's very trendy and you don't put much thought into it, I think what you're saying is that I'm easily swayed by trends and there's not much depth to me. But I think sometimes, like, you know, you get a stupid tattoo, um, you know, like, I have, like, a Reaper smoking a pipe on me, I got, like, you know, I got, like, another Reaper that's, like, totally stupid, it looks like an eight-year-old Jared riding a motorcycle, you know, but, like, that says something about me, you know, I, I also just have, like, you know, naked chicks and stuff on me and stuff, but, and, and it's just, like, so not everything needs to have, but I'm also covered in tons of runes and, and plenty of symbols that, that have a lot of meaning for me, but, um, I definitely think anybody looking at my tattoos would say they're they're certainly unique and uh, very much me. You know, I think again, externalizing your internality and I think expressing yourself is a, is a deeply spiritual thing. And I, I think even you know, there's there's that concept of the left hand path of talking about breaking taboos. I got a tattoo a few months ago actually of um, a pregnant lady with a noose wrapped around her belly, uh, kind of hanging there, and it's like fucking people at the gym like stopping their tracks, staring at it, like what the actual fuck, dude? You got that tattooed on you? And I mean, for me, they're they're looking for some deeper meaning in it. And I mean, how many people like see? tattoos all the time and don't think that there's a deeper meaning to them but for some reason they look at that one and they're like that has to mean something and for me it doesn't it was just like it was something that like i looked at and i was like ah that would be a funny tattoo and everybody at the tattoo shop i was working at was like don't get that dude i'm like i'm absolutely getting it then and again there's a, it's that kind of taboo breaking sort of thing that uh that you can reach a certain spiritual enlightenment by doing things that are kind of outside the norm you know and and you know, again, it, it comes down to not doing what the herd's doing and, and being your authentic true self. Aestheticism. 
uh, an appreciation for art and being able to, like you were saying, externalize the internalize and be able to show the world that like this may bother you and I'm kind of partially doing it because it bothers you because I want to break these taboos and break it down. Like I can remember my first semester in college, I was I took a public speaking class and I had no clue about anybody in this class. It was my first class at this college. So naturally my first speech was about Satanism partially because I wanted Perfect. to draw everybody in and just kind of make them a little bit uncomfortable because when you make them uncomfortable, they tend to listen a little bit more. And that is exactly Absolutely. what happened. I actually just posted on my, I just, I just rejoined Twitter not that long ago, which I'm kind of on the fence about. I've been on and off of it for years and I never really got it, but I reposted cause it happened to come up on YouTube and I haven't seen it in a good while, but there was the, uh, a talk that Grant Morrison, the comics creator, did at uh, DisinfoCon. And I remember he gets up on stage and he's like a little fucking drunk. And the first thing he does when he gets on the microphone is he screams like a banshee at the crowd. And I think that that's fucking perfect. And then I think that that's exactly what, like, it's so unique and it grabs everybody's fucking attention. And I think that, like, there's something to be said just in that statement of just getting on stage and screaming. You know, and and he goes on to, to to have this whole talk about magic and stuff to probably a crowd that wasn't expecting to have that sort of conversation. A crowd that was just as equally confused as they were intrigued. Like I kind Absolutely. of when, when I think about that that sort of attitude, I, I kind of I'm reminded of Boyd Rice and the fact that when he used to perform back in the day, like he'd have an auditorium full of people and he'd turn the floodlights on until people were on the brink of writing just to mess with them for no other purpose than just to mess with them. And yeah, that was something uh, um, uh, Swans actually took in, in early Swan stuff. They took that directly from Boyd Rice and used to do the same thing. That's hilarious. Like, just to kind of like, to wrap this all up, one of the questions that I, I wanted to ask you as well, just judging from some of your YouTube content, and it, it kind of comes back to the Operation Werewolf thing, is just this uh, idea of discomfort really truly bringing out your, your true colors as a man, as a father, as a husband. How important is discomfort to becoming a more complete human being, like you said earlier? Um, well, for one, I'm not a husband, but uh, I don't know if you are. Just but, generally. Um, I'm not either. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, I think that's where you learn what you're made of. Um, and a lot of people have all these in their head, you know. It, it's, uh, you know, Operation Werewolf, obviously, we're not lone wolves. You know, we're, we're, we're defined by the men around us and, and there's that constant pressure to keep growing. When you're a lone wolf, you can you can sit in your head and tell yourself about how grand you are and how you would do this in this situation and do that. And you're never quite really tested. No, nobody ever takes the measuring stick to you and like cuts you down off of your, you know, oh, if I was in a fight, man, I would do this and that and the other thing. Well, if you actually get in a fight, if you're actually like constantly tested and constantly put out of your comfort zone, you know exactly what you would do in those situations because you've been in those situations. You know, it's almost like uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky's book, Notes of the Underground. That's the whole thing is this guy is so in his head and he's got these self-aggrandizing, huge, bloated views of himself but yet, like, everything points to that this guy is actually objectively a loser, you know? And, and, and you have this dichotomy, and it causes, like, such great despair for this guy because I think deep down, we know that we're not what we claim we are, even in our own heads. We can't have honest conversations with ourselves. You're living a delusion. It's kind of hard to even say that I'm truly 100% a lone wolf. It's like, really, have you created everything that you've ever wanted to create you never been inspired by anything like you, you were truly 100 percent you i for one call that out as complete nonsense we are not 100 percent ourselves we are driven and created by thousands of years of genetics thousands of years of blood sweat and tears of memories of of ritual of religion all these other things you are not just you we are all equally unique in that we are not unique absolutely and i mean dude i i Years ago, I, I when I was in college and stuff, I, I sold everything I had to go and, and pursue an art degree, and I was literally sleeping on park benches. And you know what? I might not have had, you know, um, a family structure or, you know, somebody who had my back like that, but I'll tell you what, I had a bunch of books in my backpack, and I had artists that I was looking at, and I used to go to the museums, and I had professors that I would sit down and talk with. And I'll tell you what, like I was very inspired to, to keep moving and keep doing what I was doing and pursuing after every day. And I feel very indebted and very thankful for everybody who came before me who inspired me to get up and fight and to make something out of myself, which is still a battle that I'm fighting every day. But, you know, 
uh, I'll tell you when I when I objectively what most people would consider didn't have even a roof over my head. I still felt like there was so much there was so much writing on the walls and inspiration to be found all around me of people who would who would show you and the way that it was paved that you could do the same and then dig yourself out of that. And I think that that alone is so beneficial and you can't sit and pretend like, you know, that wasn't there before you. That is an excellent note to close out on is the concept of gratitude because we can, absolutely we can bloat our egos up as much as we want, but you got to calm yourself down. That counterproductive pride will definitely put a noose around your neck or your uh, pregnant wife's neck rather. <laughs> All right, man, oh, yeah. I really appreciate you coming on, man. It's been a good time, good talk. Minor some technical issues, but that's not a worry. Yeah. The content speaks for itself. I want to thank you again for coming on. Yeah, it was an absolute pleasure, man. Um, if anybody wants to look me up on Instagram, uh, that's going to be uh, at Biker Witch Tattooer. You can find my website in my uh, my Instagram bio and all that sort of stuff. You can pretty much find everything from there. I just opened up. Um, I've had a number of people hitting me up about spiritual questions and whatnot, so I just opened up a channel where people can kind of have spiritual consulta- consultations with me. Otherwise, um, keep an eye out. I do travel quite a bit for tattooing and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I'll have to catch you next time you come down here, man. Appreciate it. Have a good one.